Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless in the last days the prophet zechariah tells us israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against jerusalem zechariah 12 2 and 3 behold i will make jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against judah and jerusalem and it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The top leader of Hamas was assassinated in Iran just hours after an Israeli strike killed a high-ranking leader of Hezbollah in Beirut. Iran is blaming Israel for the assassination and is threaten a, threatening a harsh response. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Iran media announced Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was assassinated in Tehran after attending the inauguration of Iran's new president. Reports indicate he was killed in an airstrike at the location where he was staying. Israel has not commented on the reports, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared after the October 7th attack that the leaders of Hamas were dead men walking. The attack carried out inside Iran could ramp up the conflict in the Middle East. Iran's Supreme Leader Khamenei threatened, it is our duty to take revenge and severely punish the Zionist entity for the assassination in Iran because the assassination was carried out on our soil. It's the second major blow against Israel's Iranian-backed enemies on the same day. Earlier, the IDF confirmed it eliminated Fuad Shukur, one of Hezbollah's top leaders in Beirut. Fuad Shukur was the commander responsible for the Majd al-Shams massacre in which 12 children were murdered after Hezbollah fired an Iranian Falak 1 rocket directly at a soccer field in northern Israel on Saturday evening. He was a senior terrorist who has the blood of the Israelis and many others on his hands. Shukar also participated in the 1983 Beirut bombing that killed 241 U.S. Marines. My assessment is that Hezbollah uh, will respond to this, and then the IDF already has other targets ready. Jonathan Conricus from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies tells CBN News Hezbollah's next step is critical. Where I think that we should be looking forward now is to see what type of response will Hezbollah provide, where will they fire, which type of weapons will they use, and then, of course, the second, third, and fourth, and fifth layer of responses that the IDF has ready to Hezbollah's responses. The strike came after Hezbollah killed 12 children in a Druze village on the Lebanese border. Conrica says it's important to remember Iran is the power behind the terror group. As long as Israel doesn't present a strategy and starts to demand a price of the Iranian regime for killing Jews in the Middle East, in Israel, then I don't think that the situation will change because everything that we see happening since October 7 and many years before that, but greatly so after October the 7th, all of that is related to Iran. Conrica says it's hard to predict whether this may lead to full-scale war. Shocking comments made by Turkish President Erdogan, who on Sunday threatened to invade Israel, further escalating tensions between the two countries. His comments were widely condemned as calls are being issued to expel Turkey from NATO. The president of Turkey, Tayyip Erdogan, issued an open threat on Sunday that his country could invade Israel to support the Palestinians. We need to be very strong so that Israel cannot do these ridiculous things to Palestine. Just as we entered Karabakh, just as we entered Libya, we can do something similar to them. There is no reason for us not to. We only have to be strong so that we can take these steps. 
He made these remarks while speaking to members of his AK party at a Black Sea province in northeastern Turkey. Erdogan has been a fierce critic of Israel and since October 7th has become a staunch supporter of Hamas, even hosting its leadership in Istanbul and cutting all ties, including trade ties between Israel and Turkey. And mere hours after his threat to invade Israel, Turkey's foreign ministry compared Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Nazi leader Adolf Hitler and threatened he would meet his end. Israeli and foreign leaders responded harshly to Erdogan's threats, even calling for Turkey to be ousted from NATO. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz condemned Erdogan in a post on X, comparing him to Saddam Hussein, saying he is following in his same path and threatens to attack Israel. He warned Erdogan needs to remember what happened there and how it ended. Meanwhile, opposition leader Yair Lapid called on NATO members to condemn the outrageous threats and expel Turkey from the organization. And Dutch politician Gert Wilders called Erdogan an Islamofascist, adding that he is totally nuts. He also joined calls to kick Turkey out of NATO. The prophet Zechariah tells us how the Lord will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, as we read in Zechariah 14:12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. A brazen killing in the heart of enemy territory. The assassination of Ismail Haniya in Tehran has been met with condemnation from allies of the Palestinian cause. Qatar, where Haniya lived and worked in exile, calling it a heinous crime and a dangerous escalation that will lead to the region slipping into chaos. The Foreign Ministry of Turkey, where Haniya also spent some of his time denouncing what it calls a shameful assassination. Once again, the Netanyahu government has shown that it has no intention of achieving peace. If the international community does not take measures to stop Israel, our region will face an even greater conflict. That threat of escalation is clearly on the mind of Israel's chief ally, the United States, which has already warned the Hebrew state that Washington has no interest in getting dragged into a war with Iran. The West's rivals weighing in as well, as Russia's foreign ministry condemned what it calls a completely unacceptable political assassination. China, meanwhile, taking a similar line as it called for a comprehensive and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. We firmly oppose and condemn the act of assassination. We are deeply concerned that this incident may lead to escalation and turbulence in the region. President Mahmoud Abbas, whose Palestinian authority is itself a rival of Hamas, called Haniya's killing a cowardly act that reinforces the necessity of unifying Palestinian forces and factions. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Robert, I don't know where you begin, but perhaps you can give us your best clue as to what happens next. First, I think it's uh, Israel sending a strong message to Hamas that the individuals responsible for the deadliest attack in their history, the deadliest attack on Americans since 9-11, is, uh, is not safe anywhere, including Tehran. At an IRGC guest house outside of the Tehran, the uh, Iranian capital, and they've demonstrated the ability, again, to strike with precision. Likewise, in Lebanon, you can see that uh, they've sent a strong message to Hezbollah, taking out the number two, and the man most responsible for the rocket and missile force, the greatest threat displacing 80,000 Israeli civilians. And so as they wait for what happens next, I think uh, now we're looking at an Israel that is on high alert. I think it's going to take days before Iran and Hezbollah can organize themselves and prepare a response to what they did not anticipate. 
And I think the region is on edge. Unfortunately, the United States isn't playing the role that it ought to in preventing escalation nor managing escalation. I think uh, it's time for the United States to get off the sidelines and to start to confront Iran before this gets out of hand. Right now, the United States has to provide the requisite support for Israel, certainly has to continue to provide the new munitions which have been delayed and has to send a strong message to Iran. We should be applauding, not questioning, not escalating, not questioning uh, Israel's actions. Again, taken on behalf of ourselves, again, knowing the Americans were killed on October 7th. And the man killed in outside of Beirut was responsible for the 1983 embassy bombing and 241 dead Marines. Mm -hmm. We owe them our gratitude and our support, not our questioning and not our equivocation. Here's the Commission on National Defense Strategy as to whether or not we are prepared for the next war. The threats the United States faces are the most serious and most challenging the nation has encountered since 1945 and include the potential for near-term major war. The United States last fought a global conflict during World War II, which ended nearly 80 years ago. The nation was last prepared for such a fight during the Cold War, which ended 35 years ago. It is not prepared today. How do you assure Americans watching now that uh, we can get it together? Well, it's a great question, and we came to the exact same conclusions in January when we published uh, Heritage's Index of U.S. Military Strength, and so we agree. And at the end of the day, our regional presence also doesn't deter escalation or does it enable us to prepare for a response. We've got a lot of work to take care of the negligence that has led to a decline in our military capabilities across the conventional and nuclear spectrum, and our job is to point out those deficiencies. It'll take congressional and executive action to fix it, but it needs to happen before the situation gets worse. And escalation, in the end of the day, comes as a result of weakness. We've got to be strong in the face of it if we're going to expect a, a successful deterrence. Right, amen to that. If someone acts and threatens our regime and our territory, we consider it appropriate to use all the means at our disposal. We take this very seriously. And make no mistake, the autocrats of the world are watching closely to see what happens in Ukraine, to see if we let this illegal aggression go unchecked. It's simply unthinkable. Everyone is threatened. Today's Russia has a well-stocked toolbox for destabilization. Winds of war have been blowing across Europe in recent months, and in parallel to Israel, even if many have forgotten, the war in Ukraine has been going on for two and a half years now. Putin is militarily and politically far from ending the war on his own terms, tightening alliances with the anti-Western forces and raising the threat threshold. There is an understanding in Europe that the risk of sliding into a world war after over 80 years is present and increasing. While Putin launches implicit threats, people around him, those close to the government, say this quite clearly. There will be no return to peace. The West will be forced into peace, when it will again be scared to the extent that it understands there are no other options. For this, we should look for their weak spots and mercilessly, ruthlessly strike them there. The fear of nuclear weapons is the main reason for the cautionary policy of the West against Moscow, also dubbed controlled escalation. Currently, the world's nuclear arsenal is estimated to be 12,000 warheads, with the U.S. owning about 5,000 and Russia nearly 5,600, including inactive warheads. Seemingly, the world has never been at such a dangerous point in time. The use of nuclear weapons is possible in exceptional cases, only in exceptional cases, where the government and the territory are under threat. We pay attention to what is happening in the world around us, and we do not rule out the possibility of changing this doctrine. But Washington keeps its nuclear weapons abroad as well. Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, among others. And since Russia announced the transfer of tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus, there have been increased discussions on American weapons being placed in additional countries, such as Poland, for the purpose of deterrence. In light of the war, there were periods when Russia suffered significant losses on the battlefield. According to estimates, this made the use of nuclear weapons by Moscow more likely. Though Russia believes itself as a geopolitical center of gravity, above it is a much more significant player, China. Putin is ramping up yet another offensive against Ukraine, sending wave after wave of Iranian drones, North Korean artillery, 
and tanks, missiles, and fighter jets built with machines and parts supplied by China. Historically, China always is allied with the world's most troublemaking states, rogue states, to, uh, uh, to be precise, such as North Korea, such as Cuba, such as Iran, uh, such as uh, in the past is the PLO. Uh, and so to create strategic distractions, to keep the United States uh, focused on those areas so that we should focus less on China. As world powers and permanent members of the UN Security Council, China and Russia transformed superpower relations that are quite different from the old Cold War era. Russia is expanding cooperations as well as its dependence on countries that are hostile to the West, building a counter-military and economic force led by China. Russia's impasse in the war is being used by China economically and politically, as well as Iran's and North Korea's dependence on them. Everything is part of its game against America. They see the West's stance against Moscow and draw conclusions on how to act in Taiwan. What's Biden's message to Israel? Don't strike back. Now, that, to me, illustrates not just the US, but Western weakness. And we saw the same in Afghanistan. After decades of fighting and supporting Afghan forces and directly fighting ourselves against the Taliban, we then gave up. We left. We packed our bags and we left. While Washington is making alliances in Asia and building cross-continental coalitions against the Russian and Chinese threat, there is no clear strategy regarding the third party, Iran, and the policy towards it seems to be weak. In Israel, on the other hand, the Iranian threat is a top priority. But it seems that standing up to Russia and China as part of a Western bloc is not receiving sufficient attention. Israel acts and speaks carefully when it concerns Russia. But despite the cautious policy, we should remember that Russia has long associated Israel with the Western countries. This is indicated by a cartoon on the official website of Russia's foreign intelligence, SVR, from December, about two months after the start of the war in Gaza. This poor ragged eagle who hasn't eaten in a while is about to die. That's the American eagle. There's a lion with a British flag hat who also hasn't eaten in a while. That's it, the G7. And as the raft approaches the rock, probably to attack, there are other animals. There's a big giant Russian bear protecting everyone. Behind him is a small Chinese dragon, as if China is a superpower. India, South Africa, a camel symbolizing Saudi Arabia. These are the BRICS countries. And when you zoom in on the image, we suddenly see a parasite on the eagle. What is the flag on this parasite? The Israeli flag, that's it. What else is there to understand? Russia's foreign intelligence agency published under an article by the head of the organization who must have personally approved it. I'm certain that he approved it and said, excellent, it's terrible. This is a country that absolutely sees us as an enemy. People like to hear good news and they do not want to hear that God's judgment is coming. The watchmen of our time have the job of delivering that bad news. God bore witness against the people to whom Isaiah was sent to minister, calling them rebellious people deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction, as we read in Isaiah 39, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord. Such people have closed their ears to the word of the Lord and desire to hear only peace, even when there is no peace. They say to God's prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. As we read in Isaiah 30, 10, and 11, Who says to the seers, Do not see, and to the prophets, Do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Just as Jeremiah the prophet proclaimed, the judgment was coming upon Jerusalem. The watchmen of our time are warning of God's soon coming judgment on a wicked and unrepentant world. Are you listening? It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation 
such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Political unrest is intensifying in Venezuela following its disputed presidential election. President Biden and other leaders today calling on the country's government to release voting data amid widespread accusations of fraud. Another day of violent protests in Venezuela. Thousands have taken to the streets outraged over the re-election of authoritarian leader Nicolas Maduro. Brawls erupting in the capital and across the country throughout the night and day today. Some clashing with the National Guard are calling fraud. Protesters toppled symbols of the socialist regime, seen burning flyers of Venezuela's strongman. At least 11 have reportedly died so far. But this afternoon in eastern Caracas, a bright contrast of confident hope. People are chanting libertad, freedom, and rushing to get a glimpse of Maria Corina Machado, the leader of the opposition. And the man they say today is their president-elect, Edmundo González Urrutia. Johanna Campbell says many of her family members have had to leave Venezuela since Maduro came to power and is pleading for the international community to step in. I need you guys to support us, to proclaim Edmundo González as our president. That's what we need. We that's need what you'd like to see from the U.S. government, yes, from the White House. Of course, of course, that's what I want from the White House. To say, people in Venezuela went outside peacefully. They voted for the people they want to be the president. Citing tally certificates, Machado claimed opposition candidate Edmundo González Urrutia had more than double the number of votes than Maduro. While in other parts of Caracas, government loyalist gangs continue to intimidate civilians and attack protesters. This, as the president of the National Assembly, has called for the arrest of Machado and Maduro's challenger for what they say is inciting violence. And tonight the protests are picking up again. We're hearing from these folks who say we're not criminals. We're not trying to be violent. We tried it the right way by voting. But they believe the election was stolen and they're ready now to confront the police. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ his nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Southport cleaning up as the city continues to mourn. Tuesday evening, its streets were the scene of violent clashes, protesters throwing bricks at police and setting vehicles on fire. The riot broke out just a few streets away from an earlier vigil for the victims of Monday's mass stabbing that left three young girls dead and eight others wounded. Officials believe far-right agitators are behind the unrest. Some 50 officers were hurt. The violence erupted when around 100 rioters began to throw bricks at a nearby mosque. Police have connected them to the English Defense League, a far-right anti-Muslim group. They've been fired up by misinformation on right-wing social media, suggesting an Islamist link to the stabbing. Police have arrested a 17-year-old suspect in Monday's attack. They have yet to reveal his identity, confirming only that he was born in the UK. Prime Minister Keir Starmer had been at Tuesday's vigil. He later condemned the ensuing violence on social media. Those who have hijacked the vigil for the victims with violence and thuggery have insulted the community as it grieves. They will feel the full force of the law. Monday's victims had been at a children's yoga class dancing to Taylor Swift when the attack unfolded. Is global chaos the new normal? 
As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind, but his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal. Until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth, it seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.